for those of you who don't know, wait till Eric gets back in. I'm Anne Marie Slaughter. I'm the president and CEO of New America, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Eric Liu. To many of you uh, who are from New America, he, he was here before I was, uh, in the sense that er Eric was present at the creation of New America back in 1999. We were just talking uh, that Ted Halstead, who was one of our founders and our first president, uh, was at the Kennedy School while Eric was at law school, and they talked about the need for an organization that would create a new generation of public intellectuals and that would work on problems created by the digital revolution. Uh, Eric was a public intellectual while he was in law school. He didn't need a lot of our help, but he was one of our early fellows. Uh, and often when I talk to people about whom uh, we had, whom we helped discover, because I can't claim to completely have, have discovered Eric, uh, he is one of the people I talk about. Uh, his early book, uh, The Accidental Asian, which really made a, I remember even as a, I was a professor at Harvard Law School then, I remember seeing the book, reading about it, uh, and his work since then uh, has been remarkable on multiple tracks. Uh, and so many of you uh, know him as the founder and the CEO of Citizen University. Uh, also his work on the Civic Collaboratory, which as a head of a nonprofit I've been part of. Uh, and then before this most recent book, uh, Eric wrote this spectacular article uh, in uh, Democracy Journal uh, on um, uh, cultural literacy and what it means in an America that is changing rapidly. And I have um, quoted him many times where he says that to be an American is being slowly, inexorably, agonizingly being divorced from being white, which is really a fundamental change in American history, not for Native Americans, but for everyone else uh, who came to this country. And then he raises the question, well, what, what, what do we need to know about being an American? And invites people to contribute the 10 things they think people should know, which I found to be a wonderful challenge. And Eric and I have had the privilege of, or at least privilege for me, oh, yeah, of having this conversation, mutual. first at Aspen uh, two years ago, and then at Monticello. I'm from Charlottesville uh, and was home seeing, uh, I take every opportunity to go home and, and see my family. Uh, but we had this extraordinary conversation about what it means to be an American and what are the 10 things you must know there at Monticello with all of the complicated history of Monticello and Thomas Jefferson as the author of the Declaration of Independence, but also uh, you know, as a slaveholder uh, and father of uh, many mixed race children with Sally Hemings. So it was, it was fascinating and I, I raise it uh, because Eric has consistently managed to raise important questions uh, complicated questions uh, without shying away from tough issues, but raising them in a way that invite conversation. So with all of that, that's not actually why he's here today. Uh, he's here because he's written a new book, uh, You're More Powerful Than You Think. Who can resist that title? I mean, you know, <laughs> you're more powerful uh, than you think. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's a, a book that, that I'm, I'm going to ask Eric questions and, and ask him to, to talk about it, but when I read it uh, in draft, it has this, it, it's a perfectly timed book because it is really about saying to citizens in America, but also really anywhere because it's not just uh, uh, Americans, you have the potential to make change. You have greater potential than you think you do. Let me show you how. So. Let me start, Eric. Um, when did you start working on this subject? Did you speed it up uh, in light of recent events? Or, um, or, but what, what got you thinking about uh, putting all, what, what you've been thinking about into this book? Well, um, before I speak directly to that question, let me just start with a long um, and very heartfelt thank you to you, to New America, to all of you for coming today. Um, I, I do feel like I've been 
uh, not just president of the creation, but part of the extended family of New America for a good long time. And uh, the, the things that Anne Marie described in brief, uh, the opportunities that you and I have had to, to play together, both uh, in public events and in gatherings like this, um, uh, have been uh, very formative uh, for me and uh, really exciting. And I feel like uh, what, for those of you who are first timers uh, uh, at New America or newcomers to New America as an institution, I just really want to underscore to you, uh, this place is happening. Uh, th th this place is where I think some of the most cutting edge, not just thinking, but practice uh, around what it means in a networked age uh, to exercise civic voice, civic power, and to, and to expand our civic imagination. Um, you know, there aren't a lot of institutions uh, that are doing it like this, uh, and uh, it's really to, uh, Anne-Marie, to your, to your credit, I'm really grateful to, to be here. So now that uh, we've established we're a mutual admiration exactly. society, we'll We'll, we'll do this for the next 40 minutes, and then <laughs> Q&A will ensue, okay? Um, uh, no, but thank you for, for that, that framing, too, for, for this book. Um, you know, I, I, um, w when I was writing this book, um, it, I was not, uh, I certainly could not say I predicted the uh, presidential election outcome. Uh, but what I was highly attuned to because of our work at Citizen University, which um, is a nonprofit that is all about democratizing understanding of how power works in civic life. And so we're engaging with practitioners and activists and educators, uh, not just here in DC, but in every corner of the country um, on all kinds of civic issues. And from, from uh, Tea Party co-founders to Black Lives Matter uh, co-founders to all points kind of in between and orthogonal, um, and so I already had had over these last few years this just textured sense that um, we were in the midst of what I call a great push back. Hmm. Uh, uh, that uh, we've had not just in the last few years, uh, uh, but really the last few decades, this uh, tightening concentration of wealth, income, clout, voice, and power uh, at precisely the same time that we've had this tectonic demographic shift that yep. you alluded to in which Americanness and whiteness are delinking. Um, and you put those things together and you get lots and lots of people uh, uh, anxiously, angrily, unhappy with the status quo and anxiously, angrily pushing back against concentrated, monopolized, establishment status quo institutions and power structures, right? And so I felt that coming. And, I, and to me, though on a policy perspective or ideologically, you wouldn't say that there's much that the Tea Party or Dreamers or $15 Now or Black Lives Matter have in common, to me, they're very much same DNA. They are about bottom-up civic power right now, uh, uh, challenging these kinds of established orthodoxies. Uh, uh, and so with that sense, um, you know, I, I both was feeling this, but also sensing that though there was this rising primal scream coming out of the, the chest of the body politic, um, uh, that there was also, after that, not a whole lot of literacy in what you do after you scream, yep. right? Um, and uh, like the woman's march is a well, great example. you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think you know the screams are necessary. The kind of mass shows of voice are important, uh, but then you got to figure out what you do with that and how and, and to become literate in power. And, and this is a, a, a metaphor I'll use lots and lots, right? I think power in civic life, which I define simply as a capacity to ensure that others do as you would like them to do. Power in civic life is a literacy, just just like reading and writing are a literacy, right? You'd be able to read the map and the flow. Uh, of how money power, ideas power, social norms power, all flow through a community or through a country, and then be able to actually, after you read that map, to insert yourself into it and to begin to rewrite that map and rewrite that flow. These are not things that people are born knowing how to do, right? You have to actually have structures and institutions and spaces uh, and resources to learn you, your way around that. So Citizen University tries to teach that in different ways, but I felt like codifying some of that learning that we've gotten from our work and these experiences that I've been uh, encountering um, was really necessary in book form. Um, I finished the book and delivered the manuscript uh, before the election. Uh, as you know, with book publishing, you then, after you deliver and they go through the editing, you get a very short window yeah. uh, before they lock it, lock it down for publishing. And I had a very short window to make changes after the election. And you know what? You I made relatively few changes. I, I put the word president in front of Trump a couple of times. Um, I described the ways in which his supporters uh, hadn't just, you know, surged to a movement, but had surged to a movement that had won a presidency. Right. Um, but these underlying tectonic shifts, you know, if Hillary Clinton had won, you'd still have these shifts. Yeah. You'd still have this bottom-up force. You'd still have this tension, uh, you know, in our landscape. Uh, and, and so um, we just see it much more palpably and urgently today with, with a President Trump. Yeah. In fact, if you put us in comparative perspective, 
you look at us and Britain where Brexit won and Trump won, and then you look at the Netherlands and France and probably soon Germany, although, um, and you know, in those cases, the more moderate party won, but it, the landscape is still deeply divided. You know, Marine Le Pen got more votes than she ever has. Garrett Wilders is in, in Congress. So you're right. I mean, the, the, the election, whatever the outcome, does, doesn't uh, alter the map. It, it, I mean, it does, but it doesn't, it doesn't erase it. Mm -hmm. so, think, so if we think about this as a curriculum of power or a curriculum uh, to become literate in power and, how, and civic power and how to use it, I know you, you do exactly what all good curricula should do, which is you divide it into three. <laughs> uh, but instead of reading, writing, and arithmetic, what, talk about the, the three laws of power, you where, where you would start. And I, and I want to say, I mean, this book, uh, though we have lots of examples from national politics, uh, I think we live in an age. And again, New America is structured to reflect this age, uh, as you have increasing numbers of outposts and offices and stations around the geography of the country. We're in an age where of what I call network localism. We're doing the work on the ground in a locality, but webbing up with other people doing the work on the ground in another locality exactly. is the watchword of civic change and innovation right now. Um, so I describe three laws of, of civic power in this book. And each one of these laws yields a certain imperative for action. So law number one is simply that power concentrates. And that is as obvious and sad a fact as, as human history, but also a, a, a simple statement of complex systems. Because uh, it's not just human systems. Natural ecosystems, where seeds initially land, more good stuff will land and more things will grow. Right? I mean, uh, and, and in human systems, those, the rich get richer. People who get some clout get more clout. People who have some visibility get more visibility, and it compounds. Right? That's law number one of power in civic life. Law number two is that power justifies itself. So at every single turn, those individuals and institutions that are incumbent holders of power will spin narratives about why that ought to be that way, right? Uh, about why it is the just order of the universe that they should have power and you should not. <laughs> um, and those narratives can take various forms. You know, in a different age, they were storylines of divine right uh, uh, and, and descent being uh, descended from, from God. Uh, today, we have uh, pseudo-economic, uh, pseudo-scientific economic theories, trickle-down economics uh, uh, that are essentially a secular version of divine right. Uh, uh, that the super wealthy job creators need to be treated like a certain kind of royalty, and if you treat them well, their prosperity will leak down to everybody else and we'll, we'll be better off. Um, but even apart from economic theories, um, you know, quasi-scientific theories about race, about gender, uh, about national identity, um, we spin these narratives that justify why those who have, have, and those who have not, have not, right? If all we had were these first two laws, we'd be in a pretty bad way, right? A few people hoarding, and monopolizing power and concentrating it, and then always those few people telling everybody else stories about why um, that ought to be that way. What breaks us out of that potentially terrible doom loop is law number three, which is this. Power is infinite. Power is infinite. And when I say power is infinite, uh, you know, I, I've been in Seattle now for 17 years, even though I spent lots of time here in DC working in politics. I'm not speaking as some new age Seattle, you know, West Coast dude coming here to sell you a, you know, a woo-woo line about the infinitude of power. Uh, I mean this in a very concrete sense, which is that in civic life, it is wholly possible to generate brand new power out of thin air. Right? And let me put it sharply. In, in, in physics, we are taught, we learn, and we understand as a statement of fact that in, in a closed system, and all systems you know, on Earth, are, it's a closed system, that you can't get more heat or energy or power without someone else in this system getting less. Right? It's a zero-sum deal. Um, but we're not talking physics, we're talking civics. And in civics, it is wholly possible for you, through the magic act of organizing, to activate and generate power where it did not exist before. If Anne-Marie simply asks one other human to engage in some common endeavor around some common goal where you have to come up with some common plan, you've activated and generated power. You, 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 let me put it this way. If you learn how to use an email list to wake up your neighbors, if you learn how to create a great killer social media meme, if you learn how to give an awesome public speech, if you learn how to pressure your legislators, you haven't diminished by one bit my ability to do those things. Right? You've just added to the net amount of power circulating in the system. And now, when I say power is infinite, I don't mean either that all of us can be infinitely powerful or any of us can be millionaires or anything like that. Right? Uh, politics is full of zero-sum uh, uh, situations moment by moment. But what I do mean 
And again, the evidence is all around us from the Tea Party to Occupy Wall Street, to $15 now, to Black Lives Matter, to the Dreamers, to the Trump train, to the Sanders movement, um, that people who previously hadn't participated, when they start showing up, uh, can change things, right? So each of these three laws gives you three imperatives of action. If in the first place, power concentrates and it compounds into these winner-take-all monopolistic games, imperative number one is change the game. Be mindful of the way the game is rigged and attack the way that it is rigged. Re-rig it, attack the strategy of those who are playing the game currently. If in the second place, power is always justifying itself in these drawn out narratives and rationalizations and propagandistic stories about why it is that way, then our imperative is to change the story. And that sounds so obvious, and yet most of the time we accept by default the kind of prevailing dominant explanations of why things are the way they are. And so challenging and changing the story. And then third and finally, if power is in fact infinite, and yet most people are stuck in this very zero-sum, finite mindset where their equation is, I can't move, I'm stuck. You know, I'm ground down, I don't have any power, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the little guys. Then we've got to change the equation, right? Each one of these imperatives, there's evidence for each one of these all around us. If you just take the presidential campaign, just take the one that I didn't particularly like, Donald Trump was masterful at changing the game, changing the story, and changing the equation. He did not play the game of tradition, traditional Republican Party establishment appeasing uh, primary politics. He blew it up. He bypassed it completely. He did not play the media game of trying to seem like a credible candidate. He just went straight to his base of people using today's technologies. He changed the story of what it means to be a presidential candidate, not only by his completely norm-breaking behaviors and attitudes, uh, but by the sense that he was going to, you know, there were moments in the campaign where I thought, he, this guy is onto something. When he started at one of those Republican debates to say, um, yeah, I gave money to Democrats because I gave money to everybody because I was buying everybody because that's the game here. And there was this candor that had a deep truth to it, right? And, it, and yet was violating every norm of the game of how you're supposed to play politics and pretend politely that it's not so. He was telling people, yeah, I've rigged the game. You're screwed, right? But now I'm going to rig it for you, right? Uh, and then thirdly, he changed the equation fundamentally by activating so many millions of people who had not previously, who had been checked out, who had been disillusioned, who had completely felt like politics was stacked against them. Uh, and he was able, he, you know, he didn't have to sell a lot. He had something people wanted to buy, right? Uh, now, again, not just to focus overly on presidential politics, but any one of the other movements that we might talk about, and things that are even outside of electoral politics, um, uh, which we'll get into maybe a little bit more as the conversation goes, um, but thinking about how do you change the game, the story, and the equation. In the book, I lay out under each of those three, three more strategies for how you actually do it. So it's just this a, is a why nesting, we like each other so threes. much as we think in threes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but so, so I, 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 the way I, I think about this is to, to uh, which is exactly the the same phenomenon. But I think of it as power over versus power with. Right. That that the kind of power you're talking about, the power of mobilizing, the power of networks, is power with others, right? So, you know, alone I can do this much. Together we can do this much more. If we get everybody in this room together, we can do that much more, and on and on and on. So you're exactly right. You're creating power by connecting, um, and you're often fighting power that is power over, that, you know, a few people at the top exercising power over everyone else. But to, so I have lots of questions in terms of, of um, how you, well, let me start with one. How do you connect lots of little movements? So, so we, you, you convinced everybody in this room, and we've decided what we want. Actually, maybe not, because what we in this room might want, probably <laughs> I might, might uh, be asking me to do something at, at New America. But, but, but let's say we all have a collective goal and we accomplish it. But you've also then talked at a number of other places around town. And you've activated all of them, and they've come together. How do you put that together into something bigger that then can, can you know, counter the powers that be? So Trump was running for president, and so he had the, and he had a billion dollars or some fraction <laughs> of it. Was, I don't know how much actually, uh, but enough. You know, he had money. He had uh, he had national television recognition. So he could assemble all those groups, and Obama did that before him. How do how do ordinary citizens do that? So I actually want to slightly uh, differ on that characterization. I don't know that Donald Trump assembled anything. Donald Trump was a magnet. Uh -huh. and iron, fil iron filings came to the magnet, 
from all parts of, of the room, right? Yeah. Right? Um, uh, his, his brand, his way of moving, I mean, as we see in the way he governs, he, he wasn't a particularly effective uh, Bill, operation, yeah. operations guy, right? Um, w what he was was an incredibly compelling brand for a moment that was hungry for a, uh, somebody who said, uh, not only am I not going to play the game as it's set up here, I'm going to kick over the table and knock over the chairs. Uh, uh, you know, we're going to do, we're going to WWF this thing, right? Right. Um, and and that, that literally was his way of being. Uh, so, I, I, but I think to the heart of your question, uh, actually, there, there are two examples uh, which are sort of mirror images uh, of one another. Uh, one right now that's unfolding, which is indivisible. Right. Um, uh, and uh, for those who don't know what that is, I'll say a word about that in, in a moment. But it, uh, the other is its predecessor, which was the Tea Party, right? Let's start with the Tea Party. When the Tea Party emerged initially in 2010, um, though it was later co-opted by big money and by lots of large uh, uh, donors and, and, and institutions and the Republican Party tried to co-opt part of it, at its inception, it was just what you're talking about. Uh, a widely disaggregated, loose collection um, of individuals, smalls, um, who were incredibly frustrated by the shift in the direction in our politics, in particular around the bailouts and uh, and the expansive role of the federal government post uh, uh, the financial crisis. Um, and this group of folks, even using the, by today's standards, relatively primitive technologies of social media, uh, used old fashioned technologies like conference calls, right? Hmm. And got multi thousand person conference calls going, uh, organized by complete citizen volunteers, uh, where they aggregated that power and amplified it. And, and you know, what I call is one of the strategies, they acted exponentially, okay. right? Uh, and they webbed up like that. And when they webbed up like that, uh, they were able to completely change the frame of the possible uh, in our politics, right? And the Tea Party is a really great reminder that if you web up like that with a common sense of purpose, there was nobody in charge of the Tea Party, though a few organizations sprouted up. Uh, and indeed, uh, friends of mine were uh, heads of different Tea Party organizations. There was no central command. There was no supreme allied Tea Party commander, right? Um, this was a loose aggregation of self-organizing networks that had common DNA, that had a common message and a common moral perspective on the world, right? And that common DNA allowed them to kind of self-organize in ways uh, up to the point where they had enough of them that they could change the game, right? And, and change the equation. Let's remember the Tea Party, at no point, at no point was the Tea Party ever a majority of even the Republican Party, much less of the American electorate, right? But they were an incredibly activated minority who, by webbing up in this way, thinking and acting exponentially, were able to remind us of one of the most basic truths of civic power, which is that even though we're a country that runs by majority rule, majority rule is always determined by minority will. Yes. It is always, in the end, an activated, dedicated, relentless minority that makes the majority bend to it. Right? And that's what the Tea Party did. They made the Republican Party bend to it. And then, in turn, they made the national, uh, federal politics bend to it, right? It's the iron law of political science, you right? Bet. Small concentrated groups defeat large, large diffuse majorities diffuse every time. Every single time, <laughs> right? Uh, but when you add our network technologies today and you add this, again, this, this spirit of our times, which is you don't have to be a professional. None of these folks who were early Tea Party organizers were political pros, right? A rancher, an organizer. Uh, uh, a mom or whatever, I mean, you know, a veteran. They were just pissed off Americans, right? Uh, and today, you have another group of pissed off Americans so with before Indivisible. Before you talk about Indivisible, though, let me, when you say webbing up, yeah. that, you, that you said act exponentially and web up, you mean connect. I mean connect. And I mean that connecting happens in a way that is not controlled centrally. I have a, so let's take this moment right now where people are saying, Gosh, you have all these resistance, all these movements and activities under the resistance hashtag and label, right? But what we need is somebody in charge, right? We need General Eisenhower or Dr. Martin Luther King to say, okay, I shall lead the resistance to the promised land. And I just think that's a model for a different age. I don't think that's, I, 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 not only do I think that's not going to work, I think it's not going to happen, right? I think the power of what's happening right now um, is precisely, and this, I've learned something from my libertarian friends you know, with whom I often otherwise disagree, but there is a measure of importance in this notion from uh, Frederick Hayek of spontaneous order. Like if you let organizations self-organize, um, and again, if they have enough common DNA of purpose and kind of moral framework, um, uh, things will happen ecosystemically, right? Uh, and so 
right now nobody's in charge of the resistance. And you might say, oh, well, the people who did the Women's March, like the Women's March happened and it was great, but then it petered out. No. Right? That's just like people saying, well, Occupy Wall Street, it was great for a while, but then it died. Well, that, may, is, that it, was going to be my it, next it question. It may look like it died. <laughs> it may look like it died. But if you take an ecosystemic view, this network view, what happened to Occupy Wall Street was, to, to use a Northwest metaphor from, you know, I'm from Seattle, well, Occupy Wall Street was like a tree that fell in the forest, right? But that tree wasn't a failure tree. It wasn't a loser tree, right? That tree was a tree that became what is called a nurse log. Out of that fallen tree emerged new movements, grew new trees, right? $15 now grew out of that fallen tree. The Elizabeth Warren campaign grew out of that fallen tree. The Bernie Sanders campaign grew out of that fallen tree, right? Meaning um, the people who had connected around the, that then reconnected the People who in connected, ways. they reconstituted themselves. The memes, the one per versus the 99%, those memes, like, like a gene, survived the passing of one host body and hopped over to other bodies, right? These memes, 1% versus 99%, power to the people, right? Knock over, the game is rigged. These memes will hop from body to body, right, if the memes are strong enough. And I think we are in a time right now in this networked age where, um, again, I, I trust that to happen. Now, does leadership matter? Of course leadership that matters. That was, okay. Right? <laughs> um, but, but I think, but, but, and we'll get to that, but I think in this moment I have a deep, uh, I, I think the more people who trust that kind of networking, and again, are intentional uh, about how you stitch together and create some common DNA and common se sense of purpose across these different parts of the ecosystem, uh, uh, the, the, the better. But, so, but continue, and I do want you to talk about indivisible and, and the strategies they're following, but one way of thinking about this would be, okay, so the Tea Party starts in this organic, uh, you know, kind of networked power exactly that you're describing, uh, and uh, then it gets taken over, right? A lot of money, a lot gets poured in, and it gets organized, and it helps elect a lot of members of Congress and ultimately a president. Occupy Wall Street, and this is often a critique of the left versus the right, that the left is more pluralist and less hierarchical, and, um, is a nurse log, and it generates lots of things, but it doesn't elect lots of members of Congress uh, or a president. So, I mean, how do you think about the way those two things evolved? Mm. That, that's a very, I think that's a good diagnosis or assessment of the differences. Um, it highlights uh, at least two of the many different sources of civic power that are worth attending to, right? Uh, the Tea Party was very successful because it activated money power in service of controlling state power. Yeah. Right? The left is better at activating people power uh, in service of trying to activate social norms power. Right? Yeah. So if you're on the right and you're looking at the left, you're saying, man, the left, no matter what, like, you know, what you say, they may not be good at winning elections or controlling Congress or rigging the game of state legislatures, but they fundamentally shifted social norms in this country on, for instance, marriage equality. Right? Uh, in a way that was like, uh, you know, the way that uh, uh, Hemingway described having gone bankrupt. Gr gradually, then suddenly, right? <laughs> like it took many decades for, for uh, kind of attitudes to change a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and then, boom, they changed, right? Uh, and I think the right lives in somewhat mortal fear that the left will be able to do the same thing on a bunch of other issues, like guns, for instance, right? There could come a day where norms, uh, you get enough Sandy Hooks that norms eventually will tip, and people are like, okay, enough, right? Um, and so, the left is better at activating people power to mobilize social norms power. The right is better at activating money power to mobilize state, state action, power. state power. Um, and I think the truly literate citizen is able to access all parts of that repertoire, right? To be able to activate all different kinds of power uh, in service of the movement that you're doing. The civil rights movement was good at all of those things. Right. The civil rights movement didn't just change attitudes about um, you know, racial equality or inferiority and norms of segregation and so forth, they changed laws, right? They, they worked over a president who worked over a Congress um, and, and they changed laws, right? And I think that, um, you know, so you can criticize or suggest opportunities to each side about where they need to work, right? Black Lives Matter has to, and they are making the pivot, to think about uh, not only changing culture and attitudes and creating this narrative about how black life must begin to matter as much as non-black life, in our institutions in this country because it does not. Uh, but also then to actually change laws and policy, change police chiefs, change mayors, change legislators, right? Um, and uh, the, the right on the other side. state power and, yeah. and money power, power yeah. help. So let's come back to leadership and I'll ask you to talk about it in the context of indivisible. Mm. So another 
you know, when it, I, I take your point about spontaneous order, and of course, I mean, this is capitalism, the invisible hand, and let people pursue their own uh, interests, and you know, they will find each other, and structures will be created. Uh, but when you're talking about, you know, again, if we mobilize everybody here, somebody's probably going to emerge yes. as a leader. If we, if we said, hey, let's get together and figure something out, we might have multiple leaders. Somebody might say, you know, I'll organize, I'll organize the email list, and somebody else would say, well, I'll put up posters. But pretty soon, you'd have at least a steering committee, and, and then you'd have a chair of that committee, and that person's going to be a leader. How, do you, how does that, but then again, if you want to stitch together lots of things, well, you got lots of steering committees and lots <laughs> of leaders, and how does that work? Because this is a question I get asked all the time when I think, talk about network power. It's like, it's like with the Twitter revolutions in the Arab Spring, but who's the leader? And without being able to identify that person or those people, can this, how does this form of power really take off? So even on that last thought, I, I would, and, and your orders of magnitude more expert than I am on the Arab Spring, but you know, my diagnosis there was that the, the failure wasn't so much attributable to the absence of a single figure who could step forth and be the, you know, the capital L leader. The failure, quite frankly, was that that revolution happened on very thin soil. Mm. Yes. Because we have, you know, though we may be squandering it, we have a couple centuries worth of actual uh, history of those norms and practices. That's true. Right? And that's a very, that is part of the kind of exceptional, distinctive uh, lineage uh, uh, of political history that this country benefits from, and every subsequent wave of immigration to this country benefits from. Right. right? I have nothing to do with the Anglo American tradition uh, of self government and constitutions, but I sure am a beneficiary. <coughs> Um, but, but I think your, your larger point about a certain point, you've got to have steering committees and leaders and committees of committees and so forth. Um, I, I think a couple things on that. Yes, leadership matters. And, I won't say but, and, there's my bad <laughs> Hold that thought. Yep. I'll talk while you, while <laughs> How long the, because well, even, even with, uh, I mean, again, this is part of, of part of what happened with Occupy Wall Street. Remember, there was this constant uh, uh, kind of drumbeat of who's the leader, and 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 a very deliberate effort, at least in Zuccotti Park, yep. not to have a leader. And then people got very tired. I mean, if anybody has ever, you know, sat around in an organization trying to be run entirely by consensus, it's the person who can sit in the chair the longest. <laughs> who ultimately wins, who is not necessarily the best person to win. But anyway, I'll let you continue your thought. Well, I think there's, uh, what I was going to say is I, I think we have to make some distinctions between um, movement leadership and process managers, right? So absolutely, we need process and we need people who can run process, right? Um, and whether your process is, is designed for consensus or majority rule or supermajority rule, um, you got to have some common prior agreement on Here's how we're going to decide stuff, and, and that's got to be somewhat workable, right? This is part of the, the genius of the, of the framers of the Constitution wasn't just in the content of what they did. It was in the process of what they did, right? Um, but, but I think the, the, the second thing, though, um, which is a deeper thing about how we are beginning to reconceptualize leadership in this age, I do not want a big hero, capital L, leader right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think part of how we got to the politics that we have today is that lots of folks who with lots of hope, capital H hope, voted in uh, Barack Obama in 2008, said, okay, we voted in our hero leader, capital H, capital L, uh, my work here is done, right? He's got this. Um, and, the, and frankly, you know, his team made some choices that contributed to that when they demobilized yes. uh, the army of citizen volunteers and activists around the country who'd gotten lit uh, by his exceptional historical campaign, right? Um, uh, and so what happened was that people said, okay, he's got this, I'm going to check out. And it turns out he didn't have this, and no single president can have this, right? Which uh, he now recognizes very fully, right? He he's which is why uh, <laughs> and we're doing, you know, which is why the Obama Foundation's focus is going to be on bottom-up citizenship right. and citizen engagement, right? Um, but, but I think um, if, you, if you do an alternate history, 
counterfactual history and you play that rewind to 2009 and start playing it differently and, and imagine um, that both uh, President Obama and the people around him say, no, 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 it's not me, right? Believe what I said during the campaign, which is that we are the change we've been waiting for, which now means you are responsible for delivering the change. Right? I will be the, the vessel in the vehicle who signs the bills at the end of the process, but it's you who are going to make this change. And you've got to stay organized and activated this way. Right? That would have been a very different, that's a different kind of leadership. Right? It is a facilitating leadership. It is a catalytic leadership. But it is not about charismatic hero worship leadership. Right? Um, and you mentioned at the outset in the introduction something that may have passed over some folks' ears. One of the programs that we run at Citizen University is called the Civic Collaboratory. Um, and the, the, what, what this is, is uh, you could call it a network, but we really think of it as a mutual aid society of civic innovators from all around the United States, from different sectors of civic work, whether it's civic tech, civic education, veterans, national service, immigration reform, voting reform, all these people who do civic work but don't usually actually intersect with one another. Right? So number one, we bring them together so they actually do play together. But number two, we've designed formats when we get together so that it's not just professional exchanging of business cards and, and kind of tactical advantage. It's actually um, every time we meet, a few members actually take turns presenting on a thing that they're working on, a project they need help on, and everybody else in the group has to make hard commitments of help. Not just commentary or critique, but here's how I'm going to invest capital in you. Ideas capital, people capital, relationship capital, maybe some money capital, whatever, right? And in the best sense, what goes around comes around. I am the quote unquote leader of the civic collaboratory in the sense that, like a conductor of an orchestra, I called it to order, I curated it, I invited people in, I set the tempo, I kind of facilitate the flow of this. But I'm not the leader in the sense that I'm telling anybody what to do. Right. I'm not telling you, Anna Marie, you know, to collaborate with this person over at Aspen or this person you know, over in the Tea Party to collaborate with that person over. Um, you know, uh, at the Heritage Foundation, whatever, right? Um, it's happening because people are finding their own mutual interest and suddenly realizing, oh, it would be to my advantage to collaborate and connect with them. And we can make one plus one equal three if we get folks from the voting world to connect with people in the civic tech world and so on and so forth and, and make these things happen. That's a kind of leadership that I think is, I don't want to undersell it. I'm not being falsely humble and say, oh, I'm not really leading this. I am leading this, right? Uh, but it's a different style of leadership that I think our times um, are going to call for more. And, and, and maybe even different from the conductor metaphor. Um, there's a great conductor named Ben Zander, who some of you may have heard of, uh, um, who along with his wife, uh, uh, Ra Zander, um, has written a bunch of books kind of taking the metaphor of conducting uh, to extend it to different forms of leadership. Right? Um, and even though Ben himself is sort of the epitome of the classically charismatic uh, you know, uh, conductor with brio, um, he teaches a really important thing in every symphony orchestra he ever leads, um, which is a principle of lead from any chair. So if you're sitting at the back of the second violin section, or you're the third horn player, or you're in the very back of the double bass section, and nobody's looking to you in the audience as, there's the leader of the orchestra, right? You're just kind of way in the back. You're far from the conductor, right? Um, he's saying to you, from where you are, you can hear around you when something's getting off the rails. You hear it before I, the conductor, hear it. Because you're sitting next to the oboist. You suddenly realize and hear the oboist is just a kind of a, an eighth of a beat behind in tempo. Or you're hearing that the, the violinist next to you is a little bit off tune. It's up to you to start playing with a little bit more kind of gusto right. so that you lead the people around you, right? And that you, as, again, as an ecosystem, start working together, right? That kind of leadership, too, is what this moment is for, right? So, so indivisible is that. The four, so does everybody know, does anybody not know what indivisible is? OK, well, for our viewers, uh, let me, OK, and, and someone else here in the back. Indivisible is a movement that started with a document that four uh, ex-congressional staffers wrote, a Google document, a 26-page document, uh, a citizen's guide to how to apply pressure on your member of Congress, how not to let them escape town meetings, how not to let them off the hook, you know, not just to call your member of Congress, but who to call, at what time, you know, where to co corner them at meetings, right? It was this great insider's guide. Uh, they published this document right after the Trump inauguration, and the document went super viral on Facebook and social media. That was their intention, that this document spread. What was not their intention was what happened next, which is that now 6,800 
self-organizing chapters in localities around the United States formed spontaneously, not at their direction. People saying in different communities and neighborhoods, uh, hey, we've got this document. Let's meet up at the library, at the pub, at our church, whatever. And let's talk about, number one, how we're going to use this document uh, when our member of Congress is back at recess. But number two, beyond our member of Congress, now that we've gotten together, let's talk about how we're going to apply pressure on the city council uh, to protect immigrants and refugees. Or let's talk about how we're going to do X or Y or Z, right? And so this document sparked this incredible boom of self-organizing, right? Uh, and again, it took their leadership to catalyze it. It took them to inject a certain amount of DNA, and, uh, and this is part of the resistance, broadly speaking. But they are not leading it. They are not controlling it. Now they have an organization, and they've gotten some funding to help support, right. like a good conductor, to right. help support what's getting played all around the country, right? And to share what's, what, how Indivisible San Francisco came up with something really cool that ought to be shared with Indivisible Kansas City. Uh, and then indivisible Akron and whatever, right? Um, but they're stitching in the way that at the Civic Collaboratory, right. we're all learning to stitch that way, exactly. right? That's leadership of yep. a different kind. It's funny, as you were talking about the orchestra, and I, I love the, the image of an orchestra. I used to think about teaching that way, too, mm -hmm. that you would kind of, you'd throw themes out, you'd help them get developed, you'd bring people yes. together in a grand crescendo, you'd bring it back down. But it, the way you're talking about it, and, and you described it, it's sort of lead from any chair, but it's also, you know, in your orchestra, the, the flutes and the cellos are fine if they go off and collaborate with each other and, and you know, play a different tune. So you, it's a kind of a deconstructed orchestra. Yes. Uh, but the, the, um, the invisible uh, example and others that you give are what I call a replication network. And the examples are things like AA or TEDx, where there's a template, right? So the, the, what the leaders, I and mean, they don't even necessarily mean to be leaders, what they put out there is a template in a set of circumstances that are primed to have it go viral. And so AA went viral before we had social media, right? But you had plenty of people who needed help to not drink or to not use substances. And they use the old fashioned way of bringing people together. But there's this kind of network or kind of way of organizing this power that if you have a template and you have the right conditions, it can just take off. And that's, they, there were, you know, for political reasons, et cetera, they, they found that. But I think it's helpful to understand not everything can be done in a sort of something that replicates, but the things that can, you, you just tap into that underlying energy. Again, that, that middle imperative that I described, change the game, change the story, change the equation, the story one is central in every sense. Yep. It's super important, right? Uh, what, we're, what I'm broadly calling story or narrative is that template, yep. right? So TED or TEDx have a template. Al Qaeda has a template um, for, for what it means to go start Absolutely. off your own Al Qaeda chapter right. uh, and so forth. Uh, again, rewind to well before the internet age. The Gingrich Revolution yeah. had a template, right? Newt Gingrich wrote and created a template, and even before the contract uh, with, with America, uh, he was, uh, again, talk about analog technologies. He was recording audio tapes oh, that's right. with messages of how to talk about the role of government and the role of citizen, and he would replicate these audio tapes and distribute them among Republican local candidates all around the United States and people during their drive time, driving from one county to another, would running for office in Minnesota or wherever, would listen to these audio tapes and internalize that message, right? Um, thinking about the narrative that you're going to use as that spreadable vehicle, um, it, it, again, is something that is not available, that is available not only to the Newt Gingriches or the Osama bin Ladens, it's available to every one of us. It is why every one of us is more powerful than we think, right? We are capable of generating stories that with trial and error and practice and fallen trees and new nurse, you know, logs, um, you can finally find and land on stories that stick, right? And I right. think that's, uh, I have a certain measure of faith in movements that, uh, uh, you know, movements will, stories will stick in a movement if the underlying conditions make it so that that story wants to stick, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, we're in a moment right now where two very different kinds of stories can stick, you know, a, a, a progressive, inclusive, uh, Bernie Sanders style populism uh, or a more authoritarian, um, you know, Le Pen style Trumpian kind of uh, populism, right? Um, either way, we're in a populist moment. Um, uh, but populism isn't all bad necessarily. There are versions of populism if a story can be framed, uh, sold, and stuck 
um, that can actually attract a lot of people who are so who feel so much like the game is rigged uh, and want some alternative. So uh, at five o'clock, I'm going to uh, open it up uh, to all of you to ask questions. Uh, and there is also a bar in the back. We might take a two-minute break and let people get a drink and keep going. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it being five o'clock. But let's talk a little bit about education. We've got folks here from our education program, uh, but just in general, so you can do this, everybody can buy your book, everybody can read your book, it's happening spontaneously, but what would you do to enable American citizens to reclaim their power more systematically? So, um I think this has to happen in sort of a stacked way at every stage and phase of education, right? Um, I'll start actually with uh, people who are well out of school, right? Um, most of us here in this room. Um, our work at Citizen University um, is designed to do just this, to create all kinds of content experiences, templates for learning, um, wh whether they take the form of books and writing uh, they can take the form of videos that we've been doing with, uh, with the folks at TED and TED Ed, um, animated videos. Um, we, have, we run a TV show um, uh, that just got nominated for an Emmy called Citizen University TV. Oh, great. Um, uh, that, that kind of uh, uh, takes elements and case studies, uh, local and national, uh, to illuminate some of these strategies. Um, uh, and we convene people in all different kinds of settings around the country, right, in, in gatherings like this, but also going to where people are, um, it, it, where they live. That's one layer. Um, then I think there's another layer, um, even apart from organizations, nonprofits like ours that are dedicated to civic empowerment, pretty much every organization you can imagine being part of, your kids' sports teams, your neighborhood association, um, you know, Rotary, uh, you know, Chamber of Commerce, whatever you, and, and granted that ecosystem has been thinning over decades, but it still exists, right? Um, every one of those organizations is a potential vessel for saying, hey, let's talk about how we, in our gardening club, or whatever it is, um, can actually uh, act and work and convene and gather and spend time in fellowship with each other with a little bit more intentionality about exercising our clout and power as citizens to make the kind of change we want to see happen. If we're gardening club, we want, or if we're, you know, we, we, we want less, fewer food deserts and more um, community gardens in the community, right? Well, who do we have to talk to? Who decides on that? Who in the city government makes those kinds of decisions? What funders support that kind of work? What companies could you get to underwrite this, right? You read that map of power uh, just in the context of your local gardening club. Uh, we have several folks here who, are, who have been, uh, who after the election created a salon to talk about race uh, and, and these uh, kind of questions of American identity and how we uh, sustain an inclusive spirit of identity in this country right now, right? That kind of group, which may seem like a book club in some ways, um, isn't just a book club, right? Now you think about, okay, how do we bring this to bear? in DC? How do we bring it to bear in applying pressure on DC city government, but also how do we bring it to bear in connecting Southeast with Northwest DC? How do we bring that to bear in connecting people across different lines of, uh, of self-segregation or enforced segregation here in this town, right? Um, so that's that second layer. And then you come, of course, foundationally, when you talk about education, to actual institutions of education, right? Um, and here, both in K-12 and in higher ed, uh, our approach at Citizen University has been to really amplify this movement that's emerging uh, called Action Civics. Um, civics in general has sort of withered away in our uh, school system uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, which we can get into later. But, um, and, in, and higher education has frankly drifted also from uh, an explicit intentional mission of cultivating people who are engaged members of civic life, right? Uh, but we are working with organizations both at the uh, K-12 level and the higher ed level uh, to implement this notion of action civics. So let me describe what this means. It means basically you learn civics by doing, right? And the, the epitome of this is an organization started in Chicago, now it's here in DC and in LA called the Mikvah Challenge. Uh, and you'll know the name Mikvah because it's named after a guy named Ab, Abner Mikvah. Um, who lived a life in service of his country where he was, uh, I believe he was a veteran, but he, beyond that he was uh, a member of Congress first from Illinois, uh, then a federal judge, uh, and then White House counsel later over the arc of his career. And when he quote unquote retired, um, he said, I want to create a nonprofit and organization uh, that teaches young people, particularly in schools where they're not getting exposure to the idea that you're more powerful than you think. I want to teach them this stuff about civics. I want to teach them what I know 
by having them do it. And so what Mikva does is it, in a, in a you know, classroom in Chicago, it says, um, if you want uh, better bus service uh, or more cops uh, on the beat uh, in, in your community here in Chicago, um, OK, that's your assignment. Go get better bus service. Go get more cops on the beat. Well, I don't know how to do that. Now go figure out how to do that, right? Um, who do you have to talk to? Who decides? Again, that, the central question of all civic powers, who decides, right? Reading that map of who decides, how you then put the pieces together, right? And, and mobilize different forms and sources of power. Uh, action civics, I think, is the watchword for our time right now. We have partnerships with colleges and universities that run the gamut from Miami-Dade College, the biggest, most diverse, beautiful community college in the country, to Arizona, Arizona State University, one of the most innovative four-year institutions in the country right now, um, to Ivy League institutions like Yale College, Harvard, um, other places, um, similarly trying to embed the spirit of you learn civics by doing, right? And, uh, and I think that's a, a mindset that uh, is true up and down that stack, right? Even if we are adults in our lives with families and work and whatever, we learn by doing. And this is a time where the doing, um, look, there's one thing I'll actually give Donald Trump credit for. Um, he alone, as, as he likes to say, he alone is responsible for the greatest surge in civic engagement, civic participation, and civic empowerment that we've seen in this country in half a century, right? He doesn't want to take credit for that, and he wants to downplay it. But people are awake now uh, because the way that he has conducted himself thus far in office uh, has made people realize the, and again, not just people on the left, reform conservatives, libertarians who are concerned about executive overreach, who are frightened about what happens when you undermine the rule of law and respect for tradition and institutions. People across the spectrum are waking up and realizing, whoa, 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 this thing is much more fragile than we realized, and we got to get off the sidelines, right? So people, from women's marches to over on the right people, the Federalist Society and their Article I project, reminding folks that Congress is Article I, and Congress needs to be more engaged in pushing back against an overreaching president. You have people left and right saying, it's time to show up again and to exercise that citizen muscle. And I think that's what's, uh, to me, uh, exciting about this moment. So I'm going to open it up uh, to questions, but let me just say uh, before before I do, uh, but I see two people, so <laughs> uh, I just want to comment on your point about the different ways we can come together and how important that is. I mean, of course, that's de Tocqueville's original observation about Americans, that we join things constantly. And of course, we didn't have a state uh, in, in the sense of a European state. He's a Frenchman, and he's thinking of what had been an absolute monarchy, and he comments that Americans come together for all sorts of different purposes. And it's interesting, when, when Bob Putnam did his work on the origins of democracy and went and looked at Italy, he said, you know, the strongest governments were the places that had the, the most organizations. And he talked about choirs, right, singing groups, uh, people who got together for all sorts of volunteer projects. And one of the things we've seen has been a thinning of those associations. And you know, Bob Putnam attributes it to television. Mm -hmm. That's right, in part. I think he didn't want to attribute this, but I think women going to work is a huge part of it also. Uh, and even though that had other advantages, who were the people who maintained a lot of those civic organizations? Uh, and then, of course, just what it takes to support a family, right? So two people working, one person working three jobs, uh, th that when we think about how to really bring back this civic engagement, and you're right, uh, Donald Trump has, has uh, energized many people, but you also see the lack of time, the, the inability, you know, the, the fact that people are so engaged simply in supporting their families that it's hard to, to make this time. On the other hand, of course, we have tools that make it easier, so, so it may balance out, but I, I think it, it is a core piece of what are made our democracy successful. I, you know, I agree fundamentally, and you're, I think that's just such a great description of both what we've had, what we've lost, and what, uh, we, but, could have and what we could have again. But the challenges are real, right? Uh, the challenges of time and that, crush, that first crushing tectonic force that we described at the outset of unprecedented inequality yep. um, uh, makes everything we're talking about here so much harder. And yet, uh, you know, I opened the book with a story of these tomato pickers from Immokalee, Florida, who were uh, yeah. essentially, in, for decades, ground down to a condition of not just indentured servitude. It was essentially quasi-slavery. It was. Right? Um, and yet, after a certain point, 
they discovered that by organizing in twos and threes uh, after hours that they could actually exercise power and push back against uh, both initially the growers who were oppressing them, but then they understood the system in a bigger way, not just the growers, but the buyers, the fast food companies, the supermarkets that were pressuring the growers to drive their wages down to zero, right? And they began to mobilize and activate. Uh, but put aside that, that's a very dramatic story. Where I live in Seattle, um, you know, one of the things we're proud of in Seattle is that we're the first country, uh, first city in the country to go to $15 minimum wage. And uh, I, I had something to do with that. I was on the body, the, 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 the panel that struck the deal in our city to, to get us to 15 and the pathway to phasing that in. Uh, but I don't take too much credit because what preceded us in Seattle, most people don't realize, is a little town next door called SeaTac, oh, which yeah. is where the Seattle Tacoma International Airport is, right? And SeaTac was where a sort of a trial run of a $15 campaign happened. And this trial run campaign was to get a, a measure, to pass a measure on the ballot to raise the wage to $15 for everybody who worked in the airport or in the hospitality industry oh. surrounding the airport. And that was a campaign of, by, and for the people who it was going to benefit. Low income, mainly immigrant, mainly women workers who had never participated in civic life in a formal way, right? And I'll never forget going to some of these gatherings and meetings and campaign events uh, for that SeaTac $15 campaign uh, where I met a woman who was a baggage handler, you know, by day whose husband worked two jobs, one as a, uh, you know, as a janitor at a hotel, the other working at the rental car place in the hotel. Um, people for whom it could really be said, they have no time for civic engagement, yeah. right? I mean, middle class professionals say, I don't have time, I got my kids' soccer league, I got this, I got... These folks really had no time, right? Uh, and they had no means. But they, they organize, they mobilize, and why? This goes to the heart of what you're saying um, can be revived in that Tocquevillian ecosystem here. What can be revived and what these SeaTac workers found was that there was a spirit of purpose mm -hmm. that got activated in the fellowship of others when you began to organize like that, right? Not only that they began to found, find that they had voice and agency when they gave their first public speech ever, when they for the first time canvassed and knocked on neighbors' doors or collected signatures. They'd never done that before and that made them feel kind of powerful, right? But they, the thing was that they weren't doing that in isolation. They were doing that in community. And when you have a community that's essentially a civic analog to church like that, exactly. that makes you feel like you've got friends and family in a way that is purposeful, it doesn't feel like work to go do this after your second shift on the job. It feels like a thing that feeds you and rejuvenates you, right? And I think for any one of us who either want to start a club or join a club in this moment of civic renewal, um, you've got to be thinking not just about the functional piece of what's our agenda, what's the subject matter, what's the policy goal, but you've got to be thinking about what's going to feed the spirit here? What's going to make this a thing that people want to feel like they're, that they're part of something bigger than themselves, right? And I think that that was one of the greatest lessons that I got out of that $15 experience that tells us that even in circumstances that are crushingly evident, uh, crushing evidence of inequality right. and mm -hmm. crushing evidence of how the deck is stacked against people who are marginalized in our society, they were able to do it when they felt the motivation to do it together. Great. Cheyenne. Hi, uh, Hi, my name is Cheyenne and I work at, with our political reform program here at New America, Mark Schmidt and Lee Drutman and, and Holly. So I've been doing a lot of thinking about civic engagement and, and what that looks like today. Um, what, I, what I struggle with, with is the, the idea of, sure, there, there was a buildup of insanely high levels of inequality, a political system that no longer worked for people. So eventually there was a, a tipping point, right? Mm -hmm. And this would have happened had Hillary been elected or, you know, with, with Trump. But my question is, sure, of course, you have this sort of explosion of civic spirit because it's, it's the sort of reaction, this immediate five-month-long reaction to, to a president that people are scared of and terrified of what he can do and, 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 and his show that he's, he's willing to sort of really push back on a lot of progress that's been made. But what do you do when sort of fatigue sets in, when you've been in this process for like two, three, four, eight years? How do you address that? But also, how do you address the fact that in, in terms of civic engagement, you could say that people live in a spectrum, right? So there are people that you think the, the most that you're going to be able to get them to do is vote, and that's, and that's great. But there are those people who are like your super citizens who are, yeah, yeah they're going to 
call their congressman. They're going to do whatever it is that you tell them, yes, you're more powerful than you think, you can do that. So how do you think about those different types of citizens and how they see their power and how do you think about sustainability and how do you deal with fatigue and, 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 and moving things when it seems like you're not really as powerful as you might think you are? Uh, yeah, no, that's, a great, that's a great, great... What happens when you're not? You're not, powerful, yeah. And uh, every day people get evidence also that it seems like they're not, right? Um, it's a great question. I, I think... Um, you know, there, there are two parts that, to your question, but also there was a third part that I thought you were going to ask that I, I, I want to speak to, given that you work in what is one of the country's best political reform shops, uh, period, uh, on questions of uh, the rules of democracy, really. Um, um, so on the spectrum point, um, a, a friend and a researcher who's an ethnographer named Kate Crontiris, who you, you may know or know, have run into her work, uh, did this wonderful body of work that I referred to a little bit in the book, uh, initially for Google, um, as they were trying to understand the civic landscape better, and she's since published it for everybody, um, in which she describes exactly the spectrum you're, you're, you're depicting that ranges on the one end from people who are completely checked out um, to the super citizens that you might describe. And uh, her research basically says that th there is a, the largest segment and the band that needs to be most attended to are what she calls interested bystanders, right? So not people who are actively engaged like I am already, Certainly not people like you who are super citizens already, right? Um, but people who are somewhat aware, but haven't, but are kind of observers and spectators, right? Um, I think what's, sick, what's, what's special about this moment is that a lot of those interested bystanders are no longer bystanders, right? They are upstanders. They are getting on the field. They are, they are engaging, right? Um, so that then gets to the question of sustainability, because if you've been on the sidelines for a long time, and then it's like, okay, I'm getting on the field, and you start running around, like, if you're out of shape, you know, within a few minutes, you're going to start throwing up, right? <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't sustain that level of uh, activity. Um, and I think this is where um, uh, there's a personal version to the response, and I think there's a collective version to my response here. The personal version is um, to pace yourself. I mean, you know, to, to, uh, it, it does no good for you or the movement that you want to engage in if you completely fry yourself, right? Um, but I think the collective answer is recognizing that, again, in this sort of, the, the visual that I have in my mind, it's sort of the orchestra, but it's also like the ocean. Like, you know, some will, some will ebb while others flow. Some will recede while others surge, right? Um, and if you're in a web with others, where you're like, you know what, I got like, next two weeks, I got to kind of downshift a little bit, right? And someone's like, well, okay, um, you know, last two weeks I was downshifting. Like, I'll, I'll step it up here, you know? Um, but the key is that you're, you're already situated in a network, right? In a collective of others uh, where those kinds of understandings can either be made explicit or are implicitly understood as in a great orchestra, right? Uh, or theater company or whatever it is, right? Um, but I think situating yourself, again, the, 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 the watchword is, that I use, it's not a, a Tocquevillian, but it's, uh, it's Franklin-esque. Well, one of my big watchwords is, be like Ben, right? Benjamin Franklin was an inveterate club maker, an inveterate club joiner, yeah, right? right? And all this stuff. And you think, gosh, you know, how did he not burn out? How did he, you know? Um, and he knew when to really engage and pour it all on in starting the fire department or the first library or this tradesman's club or whatever. And he knew when to kind of pull back and let the thing kind of go on its own, right? And you've got to kind of regulate that um, uh, yourself. The, the third thing that I want to say, just because you're from the uh, political reform group here, um, I think it's also, you know, one of the great examples of what it means when I say change the game is literally change the game of democracy, is literally change the rules of voting and participation and elections, right? Um, and I think uh, a lot of the energy that is getting expressed right now, I want, to, I want a lot of these indivisible folks to now start thinking about, okay, how do we channel, siphon some of this energy to be thinking about ranked choice voting? Mm -hmm. different forms of voting than the ones that we have right now. How do we get uh, others of these folks to uh, start following the experiment that we just launched in Seattle called democracy vouchers, right? Where every citizen gets, a 25, gets four $25 vouchers to spend on a citywide candidate. Um, uh, uh, so it's a kind of public financing, but it's a kind that changes the incentives for candidates, right? So the candidate, instead of calling up the person who can max out, now just says, you know, I don't know that many rich people who can max out, but I know a lot of people who can give me their democracy vouchers, right? And that changes the equation, yeah. right? 
that there are experiments like these happening around the country. And if we can get more of these interested bystanders, not just to go to marches and not just to write Congress, but to get some of them diverted to your program, <laughs> that's what we need in the country right now, right? So I, I'm really glad you're doing what you're doing. Um, so, th so there, I'll just say also that, uh, yeah, right, right there. Yeah. Um, but I'll, this is also where the stories matter, right? Telling the stories of the civil rights movement or other stories that took years, decades yes. even, but look at where it finally came, as you said, you know, gradually and then suddenly. That's important too, that people understand that they can be part of something that, that takes a long time. Yes. Yes. Um, Hi, my name is Richard Skinner. I'm with NYU Washington. Most of the groups you've been talking about have been fairly benign, or at least in the mainstream of American politics. Mm. But what worries me sometimes is that you see these techniques being used by groups that are far more extreme, that were traditionally kept out of the political life, the political world, by gatekeepers, whether they be in the media or in politics or wherever, but now are able to use technology, are able to use all these uh, networking techniques to enter the mainstream. Even if they don't win, they're at least seen as part of the game now. And this could be anything from ISIS to the various extremist groups that are labeled as the alt-right. As you mentioned, you know, Donald Trump was sort of a magnet, and these, the, they were some of the files. Mm -hmm. Some of these groups really had no particular endorsement from Trump, but they could grab onto him as a way to gain attention. Mm -hmm. And, so, and in, in the case of both ISIS and the alt-right, you have behind all this decentralization, you have fairly centralized sources of power, such as in Moscow, sort of driving <coughs> this out under the guise of a decentralized movement. So what can we do about uh, groups like white nationalists who are now not quite in the mainstream, but certainly a lot more visible because of last year's campaign and because of their ability to use the internet and uh, networking uh, to gain attention? It's another great question and um, one that highlights for me, I mean, I, 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 I somewhat take the view that um, though today's media technologies are in many ways affecting a, a, a shift in kind and not just in degree in our politics, that nonetheless, um, certain things are, are, you know, are, are the same at, at any phase under the sun. And, and here's the reality. Like, yes, the internet makes it easier for ISIS and for uh, the alt-right um, to be, uh, to get, I think the key word you use that I jotted down, to get attention, right? Um, and, and to build their power by harvesting attention. Um, but if you rewind to a period when um, uh, radio first came on the scene in politics, um, the very same uh, you know, fears were there and the very same facts were, were indeed on the ground. It is true that um, you Father, know, Coughlin. Father Coughlin and Adolf Hitler used radio to great effect, right? Um, and I, I say this mainly to say that um, the underlying issue is how much faith you have um, in a democratic system to heal itself, right? The media technologies um, are always, uh, of, an, of a given age, are going to give voice um, to people who um, had previously not had as easy access to voice and attention, right? Um, but I think the, you know, the other A word that I would note in my response to this, apart, apart from attention, which is what media is all about, um, is antibodies. Um, we, we, these things, are, these things are viruses. ISIS is a the kind of radical, hateful fundamentalism. Radical, hateful fundamentalism that is obsessed uh, with the kind of purity that cannot be found on this earth is what connects ISIS to the alt-right, to many other movements, to, you know, to, to other folks, um, to, to white supremacists of all stripes, right? Um, that is a virus. And that is a virus that is always in the body politic. There are always people like that. The question is, how strong is the immune system, right? And we are the immune system, <laughs> right? Uh, and so when an ISIS or an alt-right um, starts using the internet to this effect, you know, the question is, how do we swarm to, uh, to surround it? How do we swarm to provide countervailing voice? How do we swarm to provide a compelling alternative to the story that an ISIS or an alt-right is telling, right? The people who are alienated and frustrated with either modernity or the changes in our society who are drawn to either one of those movements are drawn to them because there hasn't been a, they are drawn to them in the absence of a compelling alternative, uh, affirmative alternative. And 
I know, and actually, Anne Maria, I would ask you, I mean, when you were, your life, not here at New America, but at the State Department, you know, when you had to be thinking about from a policy planning standpoint, what kinds of innovations in outreach and communication and organizing you would do to create these affirmative, compelling alternatives um, to lots of folks. Some of it, I'm sure, is about not paying attention when someone um, on the fringe starts yelling to try to get your attention. Uh, but some of it also has to be about um, reminding folks, look, what just happened horribly, horrifically in Portland, uh, where that, and I don't know fully the, the, whether he was, whether it's merely a matter of mental illness or mental illness coupled with ideology, um, but the person who was threatening the two Muslim women and, and then ended up killing the two and, and wounding the one um, bystanders who decided not to be bystanders, right? What's heartening to me is that the way that that story is now spreading in our society on social media and elsewhere is not the lesson and the moral of the story is if you see something bad happen, turn away and keep to yourself because you might get your throat cut. What's going around the internet right now and what people are literally opening their hearts to are the last words of one of those people who had his throat cut, which was, I want you to tell everybody on this train that I love them. Yeah, right? Those were literally his last words before he was taken to the hospital, you know, taken the ambulance and then bled to death. Right? Uh, he had stood in the way of this crazy knife-wielding man who was trying to harm these hijab-wearing Muslims you know, uh, on the train. And the fact that this is the narrative that's going around says to me something in the immune system is kicking in. Right? People are recognizing that the message right now of this moment is if you turn away right then, you just give permission to more. Right? And we've got, now, we've got to be prepared and ask ourselves what are we willing to risk. Right? Um, but I think you do that both in media messaging, but we do that in our own social circles, in our faith circles, in our family circles, in our neighborhood circles, asking the question, what are we, what are we willing to do to be like antibodies to swarm to the virus, right? It happened spontaneously when the Muslim ban came down and people whoo, swarmed to airports and, and railroad stations to protect refugees and immigrants in that moment, right? Nobody had to tell them. Nobody had to issue a, a directive or a, a message from Command Central. But that was a very dramatic, visible moment. In these smaller, everyday choices and moments, what are we willing to do? We've got to start nurturing and sustaining that, that courage in, in each other now um, so that when those moments arise, whether they are in the form of a knife-wielding fanatic um, or in the form of um, nasty but kind of irresistible uh, tweets from an alt-right or an ISIS, um, th that we know how to contain them. But I, I don't know if you wanted to add anything just from your No, experience. I'd only <clears throat> just say that uh, I, I, at least when you were in the U.S. State Department, you were thinking about how to answer ISIS. The question really should have been, it wasn't always, who needs to be delivering these messages? I mean, we, uh, over years, we've come out that really most effective are other Muslims in countries in the United States too, but certainly in many of these countries, who themselves have a different vision of what Islam means or what separation of church and state, but that you know, for the United States to counter message often was uh, counterproductive. counterproductive. Yeah. So, uh, a lot, and, and really that, that goes to your point in a different way that the United States in that sense thinks, oh, here's a bad message, we will respond as opposed to no actually the people in that country have more power than they think. Maybe we can help catalyze that, but even then, we, we needed to do it not through the U.S. government. So, yes, lots yeah. of lots of lessons. There's a question there on the aisle, and then in the front row too. Hi, uh, thank you so much. This has been absolutely excellent, and giving me a lot to think about. I'm wondering your thoughts on the role of I'll use the word allies or supporters to promote the um, needs of those who are directly impacted by certain societal causes or, or ills, so to speak. Um, a lot of my work in DC, outside of my policy work professionally, my personal work has been around community organizing and it started um, with hosting political education classes in DC um, and then it became work around Occupy DC and the People of Color Caucus and today it is around the needs of women of color, self-care and well-being specifically. And early on, we thought to ourselves, we need to bring people in Southeast to these political education classes. Never happened very well, despite our well intentions. 
then it became we need to lift up the voices of those who are directly impacted around police brutality, community disinvestment, um, food deserts, et cetera. Never happened very well looking back. And now it's more for me an existential question of should that have been our work at all? Organizing across class lines can be so complicated and I see that even today with groups like Black Lives Matter and certain chapters, BYP 100 and others that I'm most familiar with in the, in the movement for black lives um, in, in that we are organizing among our, our cohort. So what are your thoughts on that as a movement building strategy? Do we need to be organizing, as I said, across class lines? Do we need to trust kind of the spontaneity of movement building? In Immokalee, I think the tomato workers is a great example. Um, so yeah, I I'll leave it there. Wow, great question. What a great question. You know, I, I think um, I, I want to speak to the existential part of your question first, uh, which is I, I don't think you were wrong in intention. Um, but it's actually sort of an analog to what Anne Marie was just saying about um, you know you know who should be the messengers, who should be the um, uh, catalysts. You know, um, I, I think uh, I don't. If spontaneous order and spontaneous organization were the solution to things, then we wouldn't need this book. That you know things would people would just figure out. Oh, we need to organize for more power, and it would just happen. Right. The reality is that people get stuck. The, real, the reality is that people get stuck in narratives of why things are the way they are. And the reality is that people also, you know, of all different kinds, uh, learn a certain measure of helplessness, right? Um, and I know one of the books that you all were reading in your um, salon uh, pr prior to this one um, was, uh, um, w w was uh, Hillbilly Elegy, right? Um, and uh, the, the author of that book, um, you know, talks a lot about um, cultures within Appalachia uh, of learned helplessness, right? Um, and the sense that after a while, um, when things have been going bad, um, you internalize a sense that things are always going to go bad. Um, and that, cert to a certain measure, becomes self-fulfilling, right? And at a minimum, it prevents you from imagining other ways that you could organize, right? So let's take that example. So, um, you know, d d d does someone from the outside need to come to Appalachia and say, wake up, wake up, you can actually organize, right? Just the way that you were trying to go to Southeast and say, wake up, you need to organize. Sometimes that can help. Sometimes it can be catalytic. But I think it only sticks um, if you have the allies and the messengers who have the credibility and the standing on the ground there, right? Um, whether it's in South Southeast or Appalachia. And, um, and I think... You know, I don't know if you actually know a, a, a colleague of mine in Southeast, a guy named Tom Brown, who started an organization called Training Grounds, um, which uh, um, you know has been a community um, catalyst and, and active citizen, has run unsuccessfully for city office, has just tried to show up in all these different ways, right? Um, and he can he can span a pretty wide spectrum. He can deal with power brokers in D.C. He can kind of you know work with people in. Um, you know, uh, elite institutions, and he has total credibility um, in the hardest hit communities that he's trying to actually, uh, Training Grounds is actually about providing pathways to civic and economic empowerment through literally teaching people about the uh, art, and art of being a barista, uh, kind of in, in the coffee business, right? Um, uh, but I also think about um, uh, other folks who uh, actually come from uh, the other side of the political spectrum from me, um, but who are doing really interesting work and whose view, I, I think, uh, has to be attended to. And that's a guy named Bob Woodson here in D.C., um, who runs something called the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. Um, Bob Woodson, um, uh, African-American, um, was a, in the civil rights movement in the 60s and 70s, was a liberal, but uh, either, you know, he says the society shifted and he stayed put, but others say he shifted. He now is, um, you know, well-known for being one of the leading African-American uh, counselors to um, folks like Paul Ryan uh, and other uh, you know, Republican conservative leaders on issues of urban poverty, urban violence, uh, um, and particularly within the African American community. Right? His approach, I write about, I, in the book I pair Bob Woodson and a guy clear across the country named uh, Mauricio Lynn Miller, uh, who in Oakland founded something called the Family Independence Initiative. And Mauricio kind of had the other journey. He started, well, he, Mauricio is a liberal. Uh, is a progressive. He worked for Jerry Brown running the state of California's welfare department. And at a certain point, he realized working in the welfare department is being a class ally from a bureaucratic position, helping people in a way that is not helping them. 
And he realized, I'm making it worse. Right? I'm institutionalizing a cycle of making it worse. Uh, and they're starting to resent me um, across these lines. And they're resenting my help. Right? And so he quit that welfare department. And he created something that is quite like what Bob Woodson did. What they both do is they take, um, they don't organize. They invite. Yeah, that's a good they invite people from these communities, low income, <coughs> low political power literacy folks. Um, here in DC, Milwaukee, Gary, Indiana, Oakland, Philly, New Orleans, you know, in all these communities. Um, uh, and they invite them to, they ask them a few prompts and questions, basically to take inventory of the power and resources they already have, right? To take inventory of the economic power they already have, of the buying power they have, to take inventory of the social power they have. One of Mauricio's favorite lines is, there's no such thing as a single mother. Right? A single mother gets by with a whole network of friends, family, faith groups, everybody else, extended network that makes it work. Right? But society doesn't see it that way. The government doesn't see it that way. Society sees a single mother. Right? And what Mauricio and Bob are saying is both take inventory of all these sources of power you have and now activate them in new ways. Right? Um, and both from the left and the right, they're kind of saying it doesn't start with government and it doesn't start with educated elite outsiders. Uh, coming to save us or solve our problems. It starts with us in being invited, yes, catalyzed to reflect on what we've got here, and then taking ownership of um, addressing some of our problems, whether it is uh, gun violence or uh, economic empowerment. Right? Not a magic wand, not a silver bullet. Right? But I think it, it touches on this notion of invitation rather than I'm here to educate or I'm here to mobilize you or to even to organize you. Right? I want to invite you. It's sort of Socratic, like you were talking about your Socratic method with the way you teach classes. Like, I want to draw stuff out of you just exactly. by asking questions. Right? I'm not going to tell you a single thing. I'm just going to ask you question after question. Why do you think you're able to make stuff happen that people don't recognize? Why do you, how is it that you actually manage to survive that incredibly traumatic experience when it looks like you're all alone? How do you think that this block has managed to, you know, who on this block has held it together through all kinds of trauma and gun violence and whatever else, right? You draw that out, people start saying it, and they start seeing it when they start saying it, right? Just like a great Socratic uh, professor. Um, that's, that's different from uh, a friend of ours in Seattle, um, who, who, who Lyman knows perhaps, a woman named Vivian Phillips, who's a great activist in the arts and the intersection of civics and the arts, um, uses this line that I always quote, because she, you know, in the arts world and in, in, in the work that you've been doing, People always talk about the underserved, underserved communities, right? And she hate, I hate that word, right? And her line is this, the underserved are the uninvited. <laughs> yeah. Invite. Right. Invite to share what you already know and what you have, right? And that's the start of a different kind of, then at a certain point, your alliance may be needed, right? Because once they start taking that inventory, they realize, well, we sure could use a connection to uh, council, council person X from ward whatever, right? And you can say, oh, we know those folks. Uh, we sure could use a handy curriculum on, you know, DC Government 101. Oh, the ACLU has that curriculum. They'll get it to you, right? Th then you start connecting dots that way, right? But it starts with that spirit of invitation, I think. Last two questions here, <clears throat> right in the front. Um, I'm just thrilled that I'm meeting you because I've been following you for quite a while, um, Silicon Valley. So when you even before you did this, when you would post comments on Facebook, they were always thought through and very e encompassing. I'm pioneer in holistic health, and that's what you're really using that platform to say, you know, come in, the attractor, you know, self-organize around the attractor, the physics, and that's what social media is, is social physics. And Facebook has more people on it than the, the largest country, China. So we have shifted, which you know, so they come back, we know this, you know, living, I've been doing it since the 80s. We're a planetary society. And we need a question. Well, the question is, what, you know, everybody's talking and their hamsters on the wheel, and you've got a fantastic program. How can we, I want to see everybody come around the table and really interconnect um, ARP, um, 
Joanne Jenkins, CEO, I'm sure you both know. I mean, she has a database there that is humongous to drive this out. Are you thinking of anything like that to bring, you know, connect the people? Yeah. You know, with so and why don't we take the other one question? Say, yeah, yeah. Take, let's <laughs> take both questions. Thank you. And we'll, we'll take both and then yep. we'll close up. Oh, it was you. If you had it a was you. You had <laughs> a question. Oh, I did, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I did, you're yeah, you right. Don't I have did, to I did. Question. Have a question. <laughs> My question really is how do you move into the political sphere from the, I want to call it the ideological sphere? Um, we spent a lot of time developing community ideas and models of an improved society and creating little blossoms of change. And being locked out of the political mm. structure. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That, and that, that, that. this, and I, I always call it the liberal versus lefty controversy. Um, yet we won a lot of the ideological battles, yes. but they're still running things. So this is a, actually your question, um, Both questions. was perfect because it um, was going to speak to a bit of what I was going to say in response to y y your observations. Um, you know, I, I think. As far as your, your question of, you know, how do we take these ideas to scale, uh, again, our whole mode of thinking at Citizen University and why we play so well with New America is networked. So we're not trying to be um, massive headquarters, uh, you know, broadcasting this out to the world. We're trying to infect other networks, yeah. right? Uh, and, and we infect, uh, hopefully we infect New America a bit. Um, we've infected the Aspen Institute where I run a separate little program. Um, we've infected institutions of all different kinds. Um, with this way of thinking. This is the positive kind of viral uh, the, 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 you know, notion that I'm talking about. Um, but, but the thing that I was going to say, even as you were praising the holistic health way of thinking about this stuff, the kind of body politic way of thinking about this stuff, um, was a bit of a voice of criticism back at me, um, which I think your question, sir, uh, actually touches on. Or not criticism, but a thing for us to all be reminded of, and I want to make sure to be explicit about. And again, something that New America is great great at getting people to understand better. Uh, and that is the structural dimension of this stuff. You're more powerful than you think can be taken as individual self-help, yeah. an individual like, if you just try harder, if you just believe harder, or if you just change your imagination, right? Um, and yeah, a lot of that, you know, the, 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 the kind of reductio ad absurdum is Ben Carson saying poverty is just a state of mind, right? Poverty is not just a state of mind, right? State of mind influences poverty, but poverty is a material, structural reality that is inherited from generation to generation, and, uh, and the disadvantages compound in the way that I said law number one uh, means power and, and, and lack of power compound. So I think even as we understand our ability to influence each other in this networked way, um, when I say change the game and change the equation, I mean really understand how the rules are currently rigged to yield the structure of power we currently have, right? What we call the power structure, by the way, that phrase, which is so colloquial, um, I break it down further in this book to, you know, the power structure is two things combined. It's the sources of power plus the conduits of power, right? Sources, whether it's money, people, ideas, social norms, state action, and the conduits, whether it's organizations, networks, narratives, uh, institutions, so forth, right? And so you've got to take a look at um, if your concern is democratic party politics, or if your concern is gentrification in your neighborhood, uh, or your concern is the quality of schools um, where your kids or grandkids might go to, you've got to be able to read what's the map of the power structure here, right? What kinds of power are flowing through what kinds of institutions and who's deciding in those institutions? Uh, and when I talk about power literacy, I'm not talking just about imagine yourself powerful, right? I'm talking about, yeah, imagine yourself powerful and reconceptualize yourself so you get unstuck. Uh, but then learn how to read and rewrite a map of power. And that means challenging institutions. That means challenging incumbent uh, holders uh, of power. And it means being, again, this is the part where I, again, partially tip my hat to Donald Trump. It means being willing to disrupt everything that was previously given and everything that was understood as an inherited norm, right? He's doing it recklessly and dangerously, but there's a part of what he's doing. If, it, if we can salvage the, the good of what he's doing, or find someone else to carry the good of what he's doing. Our country's political system is in need of disruption. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, the game is, in fact, rigged. When 95% of the gains of the recovery since 20, 2009 have gone uh, to the wealthiest 
when study after study in political science shows that uh, it is only the preferences of the wealthy that drive what Congress does. And that it only, if only by chance if uh, the middle class or the poor happen to want the same thing that the rich want, do the middle class and the poor get what they want. The game is rigged, right? Um, but the final thing I'll say here, um, and again, this is in the spirit of what um, I hope those of you who are new to New America will continue to, to check out here. Um, uh, you mentioned AARP. Um, and yeah, this is a scaled organization that is influencing the way a, a generation is thinking uh, about uh, its identity and its role in American life. Uh, uh, but actually, one of our partners in the Civic Collaboratory and someone who I write about here um, is a partner with AARP, which I think of as actually a real model for what we're doing. This is a guy named Mark Friedman, who launched an organization called Encore.org. Uh, and Encore is trying to popularize a notion that what people used to think of as retirement and just, if you can, if you can afford it, go off to a golf course. If you can't, um, you just got to keep on grinding it out at work and just you know, be grim about it. He's trying to get people to reconceptualize this phase of life as a chance to take everything you have known and all the experience that you had and start applying it to the greater good, to create an encore career for yourself that is for the social good. right? Um, and so he's working with AARP. He's working with big media companies. He's working with the Prudentials and the Fidelities and the people who manage people's retirements to get them thinking. And, you know, he's working with media outlets like the New York Times to popularize even the word encore as, a, as applied to this. Right? Um, uh, this isn't about power in an election sense, but it sure is about power in that ideological kind of social normative sense about what it means to be a useful contributor to our social life you know, at a certain age of life. Right? Um, and our work at Citizen University and all this work about citizen power is at the end of the day about how can you be useful, uh, uh, not only to yourself but to others. And um, I just uh, am so grateful, Anne-Marie, for this conversation because it's been really useful learning for, for me and uh, so grateful to all of you for, for joining us. And uh, it looks like we've got food and drink here and we, we can hang out we a do. bit longer. We but uh, thank but you, Eric, Anne-Marie. you are superbly useful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> High praise from Anne Marie Slaughter. <laughs>